leave him in the wilderness. It is a hard saying in terms of it's really difficult to understand. Read verse 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this. That's far enough. They're complaining and grumbling. It's not just a matter of saying, wow, this is blowing my mind. This is really difficult to understand. The next verse, John makes it clear, actually, they weren't just saying it was hard to understand. They were complaining and they were grumbling, which is a different thing. It's not so much the fact that it's hard to understand. It's more that he's sharing spiritual dialogue, drawing them spiritually. And do you remember in the wilderness what happened with Moses and the manna in the wilderness? They grumbled and they moaned in their complaint. He's just given them a teaching about that and they're doing exactly what they did thousands of years before and died in the wilderness. They all died except for the next generation. It said by faith they entered the land. And now that they got it, they can move into the promises of God. See, what they're doing is grumbling and complaining, which is revealing their heart more than anything else. But we'll get to that in a minute. It was it was written a little differently in his Bible, but basically you get to the one point where Jesus says to the disciples, so do you also want to go away? And I don't know if you caught Peter's response. Where? To whom are we going to go? It depends on how you hear that, doesn't it? Stop and think. Wouldn't it have been nice if he would have said, no, I don't want to go away. I want to be here with you. The way I hear it is, of course I want to go away. Way. But where? There's no place to go. There's no place better than here. I mean, the next really question really Jesus could have asked, if there was some place to go, would you leave me? But see, the whole thing at this point, yeah. now everything that's in the balance all has to do with commitment when you don't know what's going on. There's like a level there. I, I can work with this because there's a level of honesty here in the midst of what's going on. It says, you know what? I stood at the altar and I said, I do. And by the grace of God, I will. Good times, bad, rich or poor. You know, whatever we're talking about commitment that goes beyond the head it goes beyond the heart it goes to something much deeper so the mature disciples are committed do you want to go away it, it sort of ties into last week where they were walking away see it, it's when it gets hard and we don't get it and we're offended remember the one spot where he said are you offended because i said this you mature disciples it can be hard they can be offended yeah actually i'm offended i'm struggling but i'm staying and the truth is i don't want to go anywhere else. i want to stay here and know you more i want to stay here i want to be with you i want not for what what I can get out of it so I understand this most beautiful thing in any relationship, husband, wife, whatever it might be. I want to be with you. Would you read verse 5? Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, and every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves, two small fish, but what are they among so many? This is going way back to the feeding of the thousands. Jesus says, where shall we buy bread? He does not say, where shall we go? He's on one level. He asks Philip, and, and John tells us Jesus knew what he was going to do. This was a test. And Philip answers him, even if we had 200 denarii worth of bread, it wouldn't feed this crowd. So he doesn't answer the question. It's obvious that Philip did not really understand, did not comprehend the question. Jesus is referring to like an Isaiah 50. So where, where shall we buy bread? All he was saying to him was, our God shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. We don't have to go anywhere. Our comprehension of his commitment, that becomes a challenge because we don't really understand how committed he is. We struggle in our commitment. At this point, Philip doesn't realize how absolutely committed to the point of a cross that Jesus is. I wonder, you know, we talk about the cross and that's fine. Do you guys ever think throughout the day of how committed Jesus really is to us? And I think because we don't, that is, that's just like it's huge and no person could ever be like that although sometimes we expect that of people which often can prove the end of a relationship but not understanding the fullness of his commitment philip is just not getting this at all and based on his lack of comprehension of the one who's committed to him that commitment that challenge is our commitment now john says that it was a test psalm 105 uh, 19 would you read that until the time that his word came to pass the word of the lord tested him the king sent and released him because joseph had as a word from God that is going to come to pass. But until such time it comes to pass, there's a testing that's always going on. Verse 26, another challenge. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Their focus, our focus, was on the wrong thing. He says, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate. You missed the signs. Now if you don't know where you're going and you missed the signs, you're sure not to get there. So you'd be nowhere with a stuffed stomach. And some philosophers have said, what else is there? <laughs> but we fix our eyes 
on what we seek. They wanted more food. That's what their eyes were on. Jesus is like, hello. These are challenges to our commitment when we get our eyes on the wrong thing. Very easy to mess up after that. Verse 42, another challenge. They were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? That's one of the scariest ones to me. The identification leads to expectation. You know, the guy can make tables and chairs. I get that because he's Joseph's son. That's what I expect. I have a level of expectation. How we identify Jesus will determine determine what our expectations will be, and at that point, it can become challenging to our commitment. In other words, if we've got Jesus pegged over here, and therefore we should expect this, let's take healings, for instance. We've got him pigeonholed now. So that means I pray, and he should heal, and he doesn't, and I'm disappointed. And now my commitment is impacted because he hasn't lived up to what I thought he should. And it was based on me fixing something on him originally. Maybe I shouldn't have approached it that way. Maybe Maybe I should approach it from a position of Jesus knows, Jesus cares, Jesus loves us. He is beyond 100% committed to us. So something may happen that I don't get. It's okay, I got Jesus. This is a mature level of discipleship. And these are not for the ones that are going to walk away. That's too hard to understand. I'm out of here. You won't find any of these martyrs over the last 2,000 years that have been martyred for the kingdom and for Christ. Wishy-washy in this kind of an area. I've got to believe any of us that have been in the room for any length of time walking with the Lord have been finding out more and more and more how little we know. And it's a bit of an antimony because as we're finding out how little we know, we're getting more. We're getting deeper and deeper spiritually. That's what the Father's been calling us into is a deeper relationship based on a trust and a love that goes beyond anything other than deep calling to deep. It's a spiritual thing. Verse 52. Then the Jews began to argue with one another saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? There's two hows in the same chapter back in the beginning of Luke. One comes out of Zacharias' mouth, one comes out of Mary's mouth. Zacharias is shut up as a result, and Mary bursts the Son of God. They're both asking how in different ways, for different reasons. In this chapter, they're like Zacharias. They're not like Mary when you think of the house. And if you go back to Luke 1 and you read how Zacharias basically is asking for proof, where Mary knows she's a virgin. She knows she's going to have a baby because the angel says so. The question is how? And her question is a sincere one that's not testing. It's a different how. Our reasoning can often impact our commitment, our minds, our intellect. It challenges our commitment. There's a reason why God says, come let us reason together, because if I let you reason alone, you're done. These are the people that are walking away because of their reasoning, their commitment. Verse 60, this one has to do with desire, our hearts. Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? The word hard there, by the way, means dry. How many of us, if you were served, a dry, tough steak would hack our way through it. We might, or we might just say, you know what? I'm done. I'm not eating. When you put that in the perspective of what's happening, he's done this teaching and they've misunderstood his teaching in the spiritual language. It's like them, you know, trying to cut this thing out. The thing is, is dry. Are you kidding me? This is awful. I'm not eating this. That's the grumbling and the complaining behind it. The point is, it's like they're saying this meat is like really tough and dry. Who's going to enjoy this? Bing! And there's the key. Oh, so you thought this was going to be an enjoyable meal all the time. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. Actually, what we're talking about here is the words that I speak to you, our spirit gives life. The flesh profits nothing. We've got a problem here. I'm doing spiritual stuff and you're wanting to walk and deal in the flesh. All of a sudden, from out of nowhere, Judas is brought in. And it took me the longest time to figure out, well, what's he got to do with anything? Until you catch what's really happening here with the commitment that Jesus is talking about. And there's basically two ways to walk through this thing. By your own willpower, by the flesh. And I'm telling you, the flesh profits nothing. You might think you can willpower this thing out for a while. And I'm telling you, eventually, it's all over. You're done. Because it doesn't profit. The words that I speak to you, that might try you for a while until they come to pass. The words that I speak, they are life. They're spirit. There's one of you here who ultimately is going to betray the work of the spirit. You're not going to walk in the spirit. You're not going to live in the spirit. You're not going to love in the spirit. In fact, you don't want to have anything to do with the spirit. All your desires are going this way, towards the world, towards your will, towards your flesh. I'm not even talking about necessarily 
in this horrendous sin life. He's talking about it's either going to be the way of the Spirit or the way of your willpower. And he's saying, and I know one of you's already made your choice. He's just not receiving the language of the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. It's about heart. The heart is messed up. Euripides is a 400 BC Greek poet, and he's got a great line. Do you prefer a soft lie or the harsh truth? Peter, as much as we've, uh, you know, kind of messed with him a little bit over the weeks and, and even tonight a little bit, to me it's very interesting where Jesus asks in the beginning of the chapter, where shall we buy? And Philip is thinking in terms of, you know, going to a bakery someplace. He's thinking that what we need is something outside of ourselves. What we've got inside is not enough. Peter, on the other hand, at the end of the chapter, where shall we buy? Peter says, to whom shall we go? In other words, the answer is at both ends of the chapter. The question's at the beginning, and the question at the end is the answer. And Jesus is saying, listen, I am committed to you. As you grow in your spiritual development, you'll see how important commitment really is. You'll see the things that challenge commitment. That challenged my boys, but he's making it very clear. I am the bread of life. I am the one that you can feed off, that you can live off of. And that's really the, the commitment he's asking for, is just to remain with him. I mean, mature disciples are not moved by anything, quite frankly. They're in. It's like we jumped off a diving board. There's only one place to go now. It's into the pool. I'm not looking. It's not standing at the end of the board anymore. And in some cases, it's even scarier than that, because it's like you're blindfolded. And Jesus says, there's water in the pool. Jump. He's like, can you splash it a little bit for me so I can hear it? No, just jump. Trust me, there's water in the pool. Jump.